Hey, will you remain standing as I introduce to you a, really a dear friend of, of Pastor Shannon and I's in this house. There's definitely no strangers to us, but can I tell you, I, he carries a Caleb anointing. Let me tell you what I mean by a Caleb anointing. Caleb and Joshua were the only remaining children of Israel that got to walk into the promise from the first generation. And it came to a point where Caleb claims a mountain and he goes and takes that mountain. And I didn't, I didn't get the anointing that was on his life because I called it the bulldog. He's a bulldog. He just goes for it. Until after first service, after he spoke this morning, and someone came up, comes up to him and goes, Pastor, I just want to take my mountain. I got the faith to take my mountain. And it's that Caleb anointing. It's a call to take that mountain that God's given you. How many of you believe that God has a promise for you? Come on, how many of you believe that God's got a destiny? You know what I believe this morning? There's an anointing in this house to step into the fullness of what God's called us to, to take that mountain, to take hold of that promise. Will you give Pastor Brian Gibson a hand as he comes? Come on! Give Jesus a hand clap in the house. Come on, does anybody think he's worthy of all the honor, all the glory, all the praise? Come on, clap your hands, all ye people. Clap your hands, all ye people. Clap your hands, all ye people. Now somebody shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Oh, it feels like church in here now, amen? Well, why don't you turn to your neighbor and tell them this, say you look like you've lost 20 pounds. Just tell them that, huh? They'll come back next week. If you just lied to him, ask Jesus to forgive you. Amen? Hey, I love your pastors. Give your pastors a big hand clap. Greatest people on earth. Love them, the whole KC tribe. These are covenant friends of mine. And uh, you know, you really get down to, to brass tacks. How many know you got about five people you really, really can trust? in life, and this tribe, some of the people that I trust. If I wasn't called to do what I'd do, I'd come join this church. I'd wear Hawaiian shirts and blue suede shoes every Sunday and sit right here on the front row. But it's an honor to be at KC, and you cannot be 40 years old. How many of y'all think she looks like she's 25? Amen? 25. Amen. I'm 44, but I don't look a day older than 60, so God has blessed me. People at the gym think my wife is my daughter. That's the blessing of God. Amen? Amen. Come on, you can be seated in the house of God. It's good to be here with you. Uh, I've been on the, I don't know how long I've been on the island. I've been here 24, 36 hours. Your pastor took me mountain biking yesterday, which was a blessing. And uh, he asked me if I want to go biking. I thought we we're going to like ride, you know, Schwinn cruisers by the beach or something like that. I show up and all these men are wearing tactical gear, like we're going to go kill Al Baghdadi or something. And I'm like, I think I bit off more than I could choose. So they broke me in, right? I uh, let's just say I I won't tell you what happened to me in the midst of that, but I I survived it. I had fun. He set me up, but I cannot wait to bring him to our campus in Texas because what comes goes around. I'm going to put him on a half-broke roping horse and watch him and video. So pray for your pastor's protection. Pray Psalm 91 over his life. Amen? Amen. I, uh, it is coming in Jesus' name. I'm going to have so much fun. Um, I want to I wanna prophesy for a second before I start preaching. And my brother that kept me alive here on the uh, mountain yesterday riding a bike, uh, I, I was looking at you. I was watching. You know, the Lord gives ideas. The Lord gives witty inventions. And I see like... Um, would you lift your hand to heaven for one second? I see like a download of some new ideas coming over the next two or three months. It'll revolutionize some things. I see it cutting some costs. I see it opening some doors. I also see like an anointing for land and acquisition for land. There's like acquisition for land. And, uh, you know, there's something about taking a mountain that's massive. And I've always been about getting a hold of land. And I see that on your life. I see properties. I see land. I see expansion. I see units as well. Like, I see some things like that. Uh, I see them here. You already told me where your family's from. So I see land here and property here. And then I see it back on your home ground. And I just see, like, there's a supernatural multiplication coming to your life. Come on. How many of y'all are thankful that our God multiplies? us. Amen, amen, amen. 
Uh, wanna wanna prophesy to you? I see like a uh, I see like a season of favor. The Bible says the favor of the Lord surrounds us. How many like to be surrounded? Not by the camp of our enemies, but by the favor of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And so, so even even when enemies are around us, the favor of the Lord surrounds us as a shield. Now I see a protection, I see a help from heaven, I see like angelic intervention, and I see help, and I see like uh, I see like some doors that that they're cracked open, they're not all the way open. God's asking you by faith to kick them the rest of the way open. They're cracked open, they're not all the way open, but God's asking you by faith to kick them the rest of the way open. So you're going to kick down some doors that nobody around you has ever been able to kick down before. That's what God's going to do in your life. Come on. Somebody give God a hand clap. Let me, let me prophesy this. I prophesied at first service. I want this service to hear it. But the Bible says our enemies will come at us one way. Right? You ever just want to tell them to bring it? Let's go ahead and have it. How many of y'all don't like to wait on a fight? You want to go ahead and start it. Amen? He who strikes first wins, Right? Come on, right? But the Bible says your enemies will come at you one way, but they'll flee from you. Seven ways. Those are stockyard numbers. I was raised in a stockyard. I think, the, I think it's Chinese originally. You might be able to tell me. That's seven in a stockyard. They'll come at you one way. They'll flee from you seven ways. There's nothing better than watching the backside of your enemy run away. Amen. Now, I saw six key, their families and their leadership families coming, and God's adding to this organization. Some of them are what we call kings. They have financial resource, and thank God for people that come, and God has blessed them in that way. That's a gift from God. Let's give God a hand clap for that. Amen? Some of them are that. But some of them are just, they're, they're door openers, and they're political power type people. And they're going to come. And when they come, the enemy is going to be driven back six ways by what they bring to this organization. And here's the thing. Whenever great leaders show up, we all get better. How many leadership begets leadership? Amen? I love to be around strong leaders. That's why I'm here. I love your pastors. They're strong leaders. You get around me, pick stuff up. So they're going to drive back the enemy six different ways for this camp. And I saw the seventh, the seventh way they're driven back. Your leaders and, and their next generation, their family, they're such an anointing, such a grace, such a, such a multiplication. I'm telling you, the sky's the limit. Your kids aren't going to ask permission on what can be done in the islands. They're going to give the permission. How many tired of us having to ask for permission? We ought to be the people granting it. Can I get an amen? amen? Whatever you bind on earth is bound. Whatever you stop on earth is stopped in heaven. Whatever you loose or allow on earth is loosed in heaven. What did Jesus say? Jesus said that heaven backs your play. Come on, turn to your neighbor, just tell them heaven backs your play. And let's give God a hand clap for it. All right, come on, let's give him a hand clap for it. I want to talk to you about the topic of favor. How many, or, or honor, excuse me, but it has to do with favor. How many know the world we live in right now? Have y'all noticed that the mood is rude? Can I get an amen? Y'all seen anybody fighting on social media this last 10 minutes in here? Seen that? See some people breaking bad on each other, right? People are throwing down. It's always like that now. The, the mood is rude. And um, it, it's, it's a symptom of the culture. We're becoming more and more godless and less and less Christ-like, not in this room, not in our churches, but the world in a sense is becoming darker and we have the greatest opportunity to spread the light of the gospel that we've ever had before. I believe we've got one more shot at another great awakening in America and we better take it, we better grab a hold of it. God's gonna give us the opportunity, it's up, up to us whether we'll receive it or not. So, so you see all these symptoms in our culture and instead of just cursing the darkness, which I've been tempted to do, so I was in a two-year fight. I was in a fight. How many of y'all remember they tried to shut down our churches all across the world? 
I happen to believe that nobody has the power to shut the doors of the Lord Jesus Christ unless it's him himself when he returns and takes the church to himself. Amen. So I stood up because I believe this is still America. This is not Iran. This is not China. This is not Saudi Arabia. We still have First Amendment rights. And no politician can shut these doors over my dead body. So we stood up and we, we did that and we fought that fight. And 5,000 churches across America stood up and said they'll never close their doors to some governor's unconstitutional mandates again. Give all those pastors a big hand clap that got guts. Thank you, pastors that got guts. We are not Canada because of you right now. Amen? Amen. So it's, it's, it's been a dark hour, but there's time for great light. And so there's been dark hours before. If you study history, there's been many dark hours. Don't think we're the only generation that's ever had a, had a tough time. But I'll tell you, it doesn't matter how tough it is, God can elevate you in the midst of it. God can provide for you in the midst of it. Right? What came upon Egypt didn't necessarily come upon Israel. And I believe there's a time coming like that. Here's one of the things I, I think that really sets us apart from the world and makes us gospel light. And that is that we are to be people of honor. If we sow honor, we will reap favor. Come on, say that out loud. Somebody say, if I sow honor, I'll reap favor. Let's say it again. If I sow honor, I'll reap favor. One more time for good measure. If I sow honor, I'll reap favor. Now, when I think about a guy that sowed honor in his life and reaped favor, I can't help but think about King David. Now, I'm a student of David. I love David. I've studied David probably more than any other person that ever lived on the earth, myself. Um, I, I, I see things in David that I've identified with. I love his stories. I, I love to see his humanity. I learn great lessons from David. Now, I don't just call David King David. I call him King David the Great. So I think he was the greatest king that ever ruled Israel and probably the greatest king that was ever on the earth other than the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Why would I say that? Because David was a man after God's own heart. Pretty amazing to be a man after God's own heart. David was a guy that sowed honor, even when it was tough. You know, David had a messed up family. How many of y'all come from a perfect family out there? I mean, come on. I know your family's crazy, right? I know you got that weird cousin that we don't talk about. I know, I know you got that uncle you don't want to get seated by at Thanksgiving and... Uh, come on, we, we, all, we all got a messed up family. People talk about uh, we have a normal family. Come on, there's no such thing as normal. Can I get an amen, right? David's family was messed up. As a matter of fact, David wrote these words in the psalm. He said, though my father and mother forsake me, he had issue with his parents. You know, his brothers spoke evil of David again and again. And there's even Jewish, um, let's call it legend, the rabbis teach it. I don't know if it's true or not. I believe it is. They say that they believe David was out of an adulterous affair. And that's why there was this hatred between his family and David. Let me tell you a funny story, all right? I'll tell you a funny story because it's not about me. It's about my brother, all right? It makes it even better. My brother, 18 years old, gets interested in a gal from our high school. He's dating her. Going to take her to prom. It's getting serious. My mom calls my brother aside. Says, honey, you can't date that girl anymore. Why, mom? Because your granddad went out on your grandma, and that girl is your cousin. I'm so glad that's my brother and not me. <laughs> Oh, if he saw this, we would fist fight. We would fist fight. I told that. <laughs> Amen. I'd win too, because he's skinny. Uh, I'd win the first round. The second round, he would win, because I'm out of shape. But <laughs> I learned that mountain biking yesterday. <laughs> um, listen, it, it, David's family's weird. David, David doesn't know how to deal with his own children. And he learns this from his father, Jesse, all right? A prophet comes to David's house. He's going to prophesy the next king. 
Can you imagine the most powerful prophet in the world's coming to the house? One of your children is going to be president. It's pretty big. We're getting haircuts, amen? <laughs> We're ironing our clothes. You're going to hold your shoulders back, son, or I'm, going to, I'm not going to say out loud what I'm going to do, but it's going to be bad, right? We're stepping up, baby. So the prophet comes through. All the boys are lined up. Walks through the first boy. First boy's tall, good looking, head taller than everybody else. He's like got it. He's got the it factor, model like. Probably look like me. I'm sure he was spitting image, just like all this, right? And the prophet walks by and says, no, it's not him. Prophet wanted to choose him because of how he looked. But man looks on the outward appearance, but come on, somebody. God looks on the heart. Prophet says, I've rejected him, not as a human, but as king, because everybody doesn't have the same anointing. Amen? Learn to love other people's anointings and respect them for what they are and not be jealous. Then you can step up into your own anointing. Amen? I want to step up in my anointing. Amen? Can't be Pastor Josh. I can't be Pastor Shannon. I can't be Pastor Morocco, but I can be Pastor Brian. Right? I want to be in my anointing. And... Uh, Prophet looks down the line, can't find the guy he's supposed to prophesy over. Turns around and says to Jesse, and it's not a question, it's a prophetic indictment. He already knows all his sons aren't there. Are all your sons at the sacrifice? Silence. You could have heard a pin drop. You don't mess with the Old Testament prophet when he comes to town. <laughs> prophet prophesies, ground opens up, people get swallowed whole. You make fun of his bald head. <laughs> she bears come out of the woods, not male bears. Because <laughs> when women fight, it gets ugly. I don't know about you, but I like to watch anything fight. Hamsters, you know, UFC. <laughs> Women pull hair, scratch eyes, it doesn't matter, right? She bears. Some people want a healing anointing, a, a, a prophetic anointing. I want a she bear anointing. You mess with me, she bears eat you. Amen. <laughs> right? So, prophet's quiet. Everybody's quiet. And he says, I got one more son, but he's a little weird. Right? He's playing this harp. He's different looking than the other boys. We didn't even bring him. He says, nobody sets down till that boy's in front of me. And everybody stands there in awkward silence while they go fetch the next king of Israel. Bring David. Prophet breaks open his horn of oil, pours it head to toe. They don't anoint you just a little bit back then. They smother you and cover you with oil. How many all know Prophet Gustavo? Y'all been in some of his meetings? Gustavo calls me out. I got a brand new Hickey Freeman sports coat on. It's a $2,500 sports coat. I got it for $250. Come on. Somebody give God a hand clap for a deal. Amen. <laughs> brand new. He calls me out. He brings this oil. I'm like, oh, he's killing this sports coat. I know he is. So I try to get my head at the right angle, right? <laughs> I want everything you had for me, but God preserve my sports coat, please. <laughs> Anyway, he anoints, <laughs> that's just for fun. He anoints David. And David's life becomes a life of honor. And because he sows honor, because he sows honor, he, because he sows honor, he, and he ascends all the way to become the king of Israel. From shepherd to king. Pretty amazing. I think there's some people in this house that God may be sowing seeds into your heart right now, that God wants to take you from a shepherd, somebody the world's passed by, somebody whose mother and father didn't think you had what it takes, somebody that didn't make it in school, somebody that doesn't have the right pedigree, somebody that doesn't have the money, doesn't have the this, doesn't have the that, doesn't have the looks, doesn't have the approval. Maybe God wants to take you from a shepherd to a king. King of kings, Lord of lords. See, we're all called to be kings. We're just under his kingship. Amen? God's trying to bring the king out in you. 
It's there. The word of God, the house of God, the anointing of God, the church of God. It'll take us and make us a king to rule and reign in this life. See, David's dad, Jesse, did some messed up stuff, but he did some stuff right. He taught him some things about honor. War broke out between Israel and the Philistines. God created an arena for it to be fought in. It's beautiful. I've been there. It's in the Palestinian Authority today. There are two mountains. Between that mountain, it looks like a perfect football field, right? Runs parallel for a long, long way. For 40 days, the Philistines came out, and there was a champion by the name of Goliath that threatened Israel every day for 40 days. Shows up and cusses them, curses them by his God, calls for somebody to fight them. According to their their war-type legend back then, he would have exposed himself to them for 40 days and mooned them. How many know you could be real Christian for two or three days if your neighbor's mooning you, but on day three, it's on like Donkey Kong, baby. We're fighting. You're not mooning me every morning when I get my paper. 40 days. (laughs) Come on, men. How many of you know let somebody moon you for 40 days? I don't care if you're Jesus Jr., amen? (laughs) We're going to (laughs) fight. We'll pray the Lord's Prayer when we're done. Amen? (laughs) 40 days. And um, Jesse sends David up, and he teaches him this. He says, you go up there to the captain of the army of Israel. You take a gift. You take cheese, you take bread, I think maybe some raisins or some wine. Look it up later, you scholars. And uh, you you take some gifts up there. You know, the Bible says your, your gift will make room for you. Set you before great men. You know, in the, in the original language, it has nothing to do with like your gift to sing or to play the kazoo or the tambourine or anything like that. It's a gift in the hand that you give. How many of y'all like people that give you gifts? If you didn't raise your hand, you are a liar right now. I'm telling you, Jesus will forgive us all, Amen. Right? We like gifts. It opens doors for you. How smart was it of Jesse to take a gift to the commander of the military during a time of war? So what happens if the Philistines break through the line, get down to Bethlehem where his people are? He needs favor with these men of war. They go up and they take a gift and young David takes this gift to the head of the army of Israel and whenever he gives that gift, it opens up the doorway of God from David to go from a nobody to a somebody overnight. He sees Goliath on the battlefield challenging Israel. David, that that, that king inside of him begins to rise up. He says, is there not a cause in Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? We'll give his flesh to the birds of the air today. David goes down and he gets his five stones, walks out to the battlefield a boy, walks out a man, takes that stone, puts it in his sling, knows what he's doing, been out in the desert practicing, feeding those sheep, throwing rocks and playing songs to God. And he slings that stone and it comes off hot. He knows what he's doing. Hits that giant in his head. Then David runs down, takes the giant sword, cuts off his head, picks up that head. I believe he screams out loud, drunk on blood and victory. And the beautiful thing about it is David doesn't leave the head there. Because if you cut the head off of a giant, you better take that head with you. Can I get an amen? Amen. I'm going to take that head and I'm going to hang it around my rear view mirror like a magic eight ball, right? Or some fuzzy dice. And everywhere I go, I'm going to be like, that's a giant's head. You got one of those, huh? What do you got on your, what do you got around your mirror? An eight ball. What a loser. Huh? Giant's head. You know, a lot of people believe he took that giant's head up to the Jebusite stronghold, which would become the city of David. Stood outside where he was going to go take and live, held that giant's head up and said, hey, all you Jebusites, look and see what happens when you mess with a covenant man. And he comes back and he gets it later and he lives there. See, David learns from Jesse to sow honor, takes a giant's head, and one day he reaps favor. They're writing songs about him. It says Saul's killed his thousands, but David... His tens of thousands. 
How many of y'all want to sow some honor? How many of y'all want to reap some favor? Come on, somebody want to sow some honor. Somebody want to reap some favor. How many want your children to sow some honor? And your children to reap some favor. What about those grandkids? Sow some honor, amen? Reap some favor. See, David learned so much about sowing honor. David messes up. He numbers. He numbers his army. God told him, don't count the people. Don't do a census. Nothing wrong with counting people. In church, we count everybody. If you're pregnant, we count you twice. Oh, uh, because we want to, you know, we want to have good numbers. But the whole rule was don't trust in your, in your army. God wanted David to trust in him. David breaks the law. Play gets Israel. People are dropping like flies. And he goes over to this guy's place called Arunah. They're both pretty much billionaires at this point in their life. David had become a billionaire. And we could use some of those in the body of Christ. I wish God would give me a chance at being a billionaire. I won't even try to take over the world like some evil billionaires we have now, right? I won't even try it. I'll just be philanthropist without trying to chip the world. That's what I'll do if they make me a billionaire. So these two guys are billionaires. David's going to give an offering to God to try to stop the plague. Naruna comes out and says, take whatever I got, David. What's money between me and you? David says these words back to Arona. Now I'll pay for everything I take because I will not give God a sacrifice that costs me nothing. It's a revelation there, isn't it? See, honor costs you something. Honor has to cost for it to be honor. Sacrifice has to cost for it to be sacrifice. It's got to cost. It's got to hurt. It's got to be felt. It's got to touch something on the inside of you. If it doesn't touch the inside of you, how can it touch God? And so David pays and he sacrifices and the plague stops. I could preach this for hours. But God keeps lifting David because David sows honor. And David reaps favor. And finally, when he's somewhere around 40, gets prophesied to, who knows, somewhere 15 to 17. It's a lot of years. He finally becomes the king of both the southern and the northern kingdom of Israel. God gives him rest, the Bible says, from all of his enemies. David is now living fat. He's on top of the hill. In Israel, it's still like this. If you're poor, you live on the bottom of the hill, especially like this years ago. The wealthier you come, the higher you live on the hill. Why? Because waste runs downhill. How many don't want your neighbor's waste getting close to you, right? They're supposed to carry it outside of the camp, but what if your neighbor's a slob above you? It's a bad deal. You want to be on top. Here's how the devil tries to destroy people. Tries to destroy you at the beginning before you grow. Kill it before he grows. Jesus, Moses. Then the next way he tries to kill you is once you ascend to the top of your life and you're not living at the bottom of the mountain but the top of the mountain where everybody can see you. He tries to take you out there so it can embarrass the entire kingdom. How many of y'all have seen both of those strategies work on people from the kingdom of darkness? Well, David makes some big mistakes and you know about them. The mistake he makes with Bathsheba, I won't talk about it now, Bathsheba. But David's living high on the hog. Come on, he's in his house, city of David. He's already been a man of honor, man of worship, brought back the Ark of the Covenant, has, the, has worship going around the clock, right up on the top of Mount Moriah. He's paid people to sing and worship up there. Wherever you go in Israel, you could see the praises of God and you could see the Ark of the Covenant. I'm so thankful that this church is a place of glorious worship and praise and magnifying the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Your worship is beautiful. Come on, let's give God a hand clap for all the people that lead us and help us and usher us into the presence of God. That's sowing honor and reaping favor. David's up in, in his house. And the Bible says he's dwelling. He's dwelling in, in, in paneled uh, house. Cedar panels would have had to be imported from Tyre. He's living in, in imported goods. He's switched from smoking Swisher sweets to Cubans. Now, 
Uh, don't smoke, it'll kill you, amen? I'm just saying he's stepping up. He's looking at his flat screen. He's eating caviar. He's doing well. David has a revelation. Here I sat in a house with cedar panels. But the Ark of the Covenant is up there on Mount Moriah in a tent. It breaks his heart. David has a heart for the house of God. Oh, how I wish we could get the church in America one last time to get a real heart. Come on, somebody, for the house of the living God. There's nothing else like the church. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The only thing Jesus is building on the earth, you're in it right now, you are in the church. It's the answer to poverty. It's the answer to disease. It's the answer to depression. It's the answer to fear. It's the answer to sickness. It's the answer to marital issues. It's the answer to suicidal tendencies. It's the house of the living God. David's there and he's like, and this is an Old Testament example of where we are now. David's like, man, I'm living in this great place and the house is in ruins. If we get Americans to think like that, we'd have the most glorious church in the world. Evangelism would change. Everything could change overnight. So David, David, David's there and he goes down to the prophet. He says to the prophet, prophet, we're going to build God a glorious house. He says, I'm going to build God a temple unlike that's ever been seen. And the prophet agrees. He's like, David, yeah, you are. Let me tell you something about prophets. I love them. I love the prophetic ministry. But the greatest prophets on earth batted about 90%. The prophet told David you could build the house the first time. He was wrong. You might as well go ahead and understand these are people too. Can I get an amen? How many of y'all have ever been wrong? Can I get, come on, come on, somebody out there. All right, we've all been wrong, right? Prophet goes and lays down. God whispers in the prophet's ear. What you told David was wrong. David can't build my house. Go back and tell him. His hands are covered in blood. Now, David wasn't just a worshiper. David wasn't just a businessman. David wasn't just a kingdom builder. David was a man of war. But that's not why he couldn't build God's house. For all of you that have served under the sound of my voice, or LEOs, or whatever you've done like that, military, that have shed blood for justice and protection, that is not a sin. There is a difference between killing and murder. There is a difference between killing and murder. Where it says, thou shalt not kill, it should be more accurately translated, thou shalt not murder. So listen, those of you that had to do that to protect a nation, a people, justice, whatever it is, you did that for peace on the earth. Be free, you are not guilty. Come on, let's give all these people that served us a big hand clap. Thank you for putting your life on the line. We appreciate you and love you. We're free because of you right now. Why could David not build the house? It's because he assassinated one of his own men by the name of Uriah to take his wife Bathsheba. That's murder. So the prophet gets up. The prophet has to go and tell, tell David. David, God's spoken. Elohim woke me up. He said that you can't build the house because there's too much blood. Blood of your eyes on your hands. It's a tough word to deliver. I've given some tough ones throughout the years. You know what most people do when you tell them no? They flip their lids. How many of y'all hate No. I hate no. No is for losers, amen? <laughs> All his promises are yes and amen. No is for losers. 
It's not my no, that's somebody else's no. You heard wrong. You heard from my neighbor. That no prophetic no's for my neighbor, it's not for me. You tell people no in church, a lot of times they feel led to go somewhere else. You know, pastor, all of a sudden I feel led to go to the Methodist church. Or I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm down with that Joseph Smith. I think I might be a Mormon for a while. I've always wanted to ride a bicycle and knock on doors. Maybe I'll be a JW, you know, I don't know. They're out. <laughs> but you know what David does? David owns it. How big is that? How mature is that? The test of no is the toughest test you'll ever pass. It's the toughest test you'll ever pass. Now I don't even know if I've passed it yet. David says to the prophet, well, I've messed up big time. Maybe, maybe I can't build it now. Could I at least buy it? If I can't build it, can I pay for some of it? Maybe I won't get to dedicate it, but the next generation can use it. So I understand that I messed it all up and I can't build it, but let me pay for it, let me buy it. And instead of David taking his ball and going home, what David did is he spent the next years of his life putting together the greatest offering that would ever be put together for the glory of God to build a temple in the midst of Israel where the eye of God would look upon and never look away again. So the next generation could see the glory and grandeur of God. Let me show you what David did. David did this, 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 1, it reads like this. He said, King David said to all the assembly, puts together a building project thing, all right? How many of y'all have ever been in a building project where you get a little church model of what we're going to build and all that, you know? It's like, you know, we're, gonna, we're, going, we're going on giving now. And uh, puts together, and he says this says to all the assembly, my son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. How about that? God chose a man who was inexperienced. Why? Because he couldn't rely on his own knowledge. He had to rely on God. Sometimes you, you start to know too much, God can't use you anymore. I've been there. Right? Had one of the, well, they put me on a magazine, fastest growing church in America, worst thing that ever happened to me. I thought I was an expert. I was an idiot. Praise God. <laughs> he says this, my son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. And the work is great. Come on, how many of y'all think the church is a great work? The work is great, amen? Because the, the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. What we do here, we do for God, not for man. He alone is worthy of all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Now for the house of my God, I prepared with all my might. He starts listing what he's put together. Gold for things of gold, silver for things of silver, bronze for things of bronze, iron for things of iron. He gives this great list. And he says this, I did all this because I've set my affection on the house of my God. Can't even build it. Might not even see it. Might die before it's completed but his affection's there for the house of God. And he tells them everything he has. Here's what scholars told me about 10 years ago, not counting modern inflation. 10 years ago, the offering David brought for the house of God that day was worth about $1.2 billion. How many of y'all would like to write a check for $1.2 billion for the glory Come on, how many of y'all would like to write a check for $1.2 billion for the glory? How many of y'all would like to write a check for $1.2 billion for the glory of God? And then David tells them all, this is what I'm doing, calls them out. And at the end of it, he says these words. He says, he's got all these choice families together. They knew David, they'd fought with David. There are men there that had been on military deals with David. They'd seen him. They knew he put his money in his life where his mouth was. David stands up in front of them all, 
And he says this, who else is willing to consecrate themselves with me? Give to the work of the Lord. See, honor and giving are connected. You cannot remove the two things. Honor the Lord with your first fruits, amen? Honor and giving, they're connected. When somebody learns to honor the house of God and honor the people of God and honor the God of the house, there's something supernatural. They have now sown honor and they shall reap favor. Now, I'm not even saying everything's gonna be perfect or easy, but I'm telling you, there's a favor on your life. It doesn't matter how hard it gets. Even though your enemy comes at you one way, they'll flee from you seven ways. And what the devil means to kill you, God will turn around. Well, what is sent to bury you will end up blessing you. Can I get an amen? That's the kind of favor you start to reap. And so these guys respond to what David says. You know what they do? They bring another $1.8 billion to build the temple. They're at they're $3 billion. And then Israel's got money they've set aside in the, in the national treasury to kick in. Before Solomon ever had to lay a brick, there's over $3 billion for the glory of God and that temple's gonna be built on Mount Moriah. Come on, somebody. How many of y'all like to see something like that before we build the next KC building? The money is already there and it's just done. And come on, the people consecrate themselves and the honor flows. I'll tell you, there's nothing stronger. You know, I do, I do an offering at our church, one big faith offering a year. We take tithes and offerings. We do that weekly, right? Uh, I preach this once a year at my church. People talk bad about me during that time of year. I don't care. They're like, he, all he wants is your money. I'm like, yeah, when I take that offer and I lay it on the bed and I roll in it when I get home. <laughs> Just roll in it like McDuck, right? Y'all remember Scrooge McDuck? All you want is my money. No, all that Coke dealer wants is your money. All Amazon wants is your money. All the US government wants is your money. All Walmart wants is, call Walmart and ask them if they can send somebody over to pray for your grandmother in the hospital. <laughs> yeah, my, my grandmother's sick. Could you maybe send somebody over to pray for her? She's in ICU room seven, down at the hospital. They'll be like, what are you smoking? You call here, somebody will pray for you. Because it's never been about the money. It's always been about the glory of God. The money's just a vehicle that gives us what we gotta have to do it. Come on, somebody give God a hand. It's always been about the glory of God. Money. What is money gonna do? I mean, listen, I hope you all have a boatload of it. How many know what's new today is trash tomorrow? But there's an eternity that matters. Here's what I want us to do. I don't want you to take an offering for me. I want to take an offering for the house. How many of y'all think this house is worth investing in today? Come on, how many of y'all think this house is worth investing in today? How many of y'all think this house is worth investing in today? I'll tell you, this place has been like water to me. I've come to KC in some of the darkest days of my life. Got prophetic words that changed me. When I'm in big trouble, and I've been in big trouble, I'm talking to the tune of 1,500 death threats in a week, you know who calls me? This guy with this real deep voice. Checks on me. Dr. Morocco. Making sure I'm gonna make it. If you need somewhere to come, son, you come here, stay as long as you need. That's big. Pastor Josh calls and checks on me. Pastor Shannon calls and checks on Jesse. The Brackens, they're more family to me than a lot of my family family. I tell you, you're in a great place. How many are thankful for this house? I'm thankful for this house. Thankful for it. 
There's no other house up. There's nobody else I connect to like I connect to KC. Nobody else. Here, here's what I want to, it's a great, great place. Here, here's what I want to do. I want us, if I could get somebody to come play the keys, because if I play, it's going to be terrible. But I, uh, I want to do that. I want um, ushers, bring everybody an envelope in, in their hand. We're going to do some faith giving for the house today. All right? Uh, you know how many offerings I've ever taken outside of my church like this? Second time I've ever done it. I've been preaching 20-something years. Second time. second time I want everybody to do something before you start writing what you're going to give we're going to give this over the course I want everybody to give something today but I want us to make a faith pledge of what we're going to give over the next four to eight weeks all right we'll give you time right it's not I can just spring this on you and uh I've been doing this in January beginning of January every year for I don't know how many years now we give years now 12 years and it's enabled us to build church buildings put roofs on buildings launch campuses gave 70,000 this year to get people out of the way of the Taliban killing machine we just left them there we left them there and I had spec op friends that went in to get them and I don't know how to do that but I can raise some money to get them out built orphanages. I mean, that's the kind of stuff this church does. All I mean, it's what KC does. Give everybody an envelope, whether they want it or not. Just stick it, stick it in there, you know. Just stick it there. Like those old long, long, anybody go to one of those churches that had the long offering baskets with the long sticks? You poke people with them. Like cattle prods. I was raised on a farm. I want one like that with a hot shot on the end of it. Don't tell PETA, right? It's like, hey, come on. You can do better than that. I know where you work. Because people give wherever they want to give. They do whatever they want to do. What's a pack of cigarettes cost now? Like $100? I quit smoking. They were $225. My cardiologist recently told me I could eat all the red meat I wanted. I'm like, can I smoke reds again? I love you. <laughs> He's like, no carbs, no sugar, just meat. Um, that has nothing to do with this offering, by the way. <laughs> All right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put a number on the top of what you're going to give over the next four to eight weeks. Make it sacrificial, make it honorable. What is that? I don't know. To the widow's mind, it's not the amount of, of money, it's the amount of sacrifice. Widow gives a penny, Jesus stops the service. He's looking in the bucket. He's like, oh my Lord. This woman gave out of her, out of her necessity. I remember watching a guy that made $35,000 a year give a $15,000 offering. I knew what he made. I, I mean, I wept out loud. I couldn't believe it. I cried like, like when I watch Still Magnolias or The Notebook, I just, because I see the sacrifice, amen? Cried like I was listening to Nora Jones or something like that. Then there's the middle class American. What should a middle class American give? That's a lot of us. I don't know. I used to say, if you've never given a thousand dollar offering, you should. Maybe Now with inflation, I don't know what it is, two, five, ten, you know? People at our church, before we took our faith offering, they're like, I wish we would have done this before war broke out. I'm like, I don't. Now we get to see who has faith. Before gas got high, no, I, I want to see who's got faith. So there's the, there's the widow's might, right? There's the average American, which is a lot of people. Then there's the king. And I don't let anybody off the hook because we all ought to sacrifice. And there's some kings that ought to give something significant today to the house of God. I've set my affection on the house of God because it's not for man, but it's for God. Give you a little time. 
Ask God what, what He wants you to do. Then we're going to bring it. We're going to, is it all right if they drop it on the altar? Gold school like that? You get it ready. I want to bring a sacrificial offering. I want you to drop it on the altar. And I'm telling you, we're going to sow some honor and there's going to be some favor popping. I'm telling you, some miracles are going to happen. The properties I've seen, the, the, the babies that couldn't be born for 13 years, that just was birthed this last week in our campus in Owensboro. I'm talking about the healings, the properties acquired, the prodigals that have come home. When you sow honor, you reap favor. Can you buy a miracle? Lord, no. But it's an extension of your heart. Go ahead, Pastor. Just encourage, you know, Pastor Shannon and I are need, believe in God for some miracles. And we understand the, the power of the moment. And uh, I thank God for a guest speaker that says, hey, I don't, I don't want this offering to go to me. I, I believe that there's something that God wants to do in the house. And he asked me, can we please take an offering for the house? So this, this offering is going to be poured into this ministry. There's big things that this house is believing God for. We're stepping into a season, probably one of the greatest harvests that we're going to see all year long. And you're a part of that. So if you're writing out a check, write your checks out to KC or King's Chapel. No, we're still, we're still going to honor our guests and bless them. But we're going to believe in faith that God's going to do some miracles. Amen. And so thank you so much for that. Ushers, if you could go ahead and bring the buckets. You guys got them there. Will you lift your offering to the Lord? This is a, hey, this is a serious moment. Father, you see the people that are giving. You see the miracles that are needed. Lord, we never, ever in this house, we never take these moments lightly. Because, Lord, we know that there are Kairos moments, ordained seasons and times. That you brought the Gibsons here for this word, Lord God, to give faith to people. That people begin to step into their destiny and purpose. That people take mountains from God that have been promised to them. And Father, I pray that right now, an anointing, an anointing right now in Jesus' name. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You know, Representative Ward, I want to pray for you. You just stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Jean, stand to your feet. Father, I declare, I just want to honor you first of all because you have represented this area for so long. We love you. We love you and we honor you. But God says that there's, he's not done with the elevation, that he is raising you up for such a time as this, that he is opening up supernatural doors of favor. Watch and see the favor that God releases upon your life in this next season. New levels, new doors, new favor. Even at times when you, fe you felt like people were trying to silence you, God says, I'm going to give you even a louder voice and a clarion call. And people that had before used to shut you down are going to begin to ask you and begin to ask you for the wisdom and begin to listen and tune in to your voice. So, Father, I thank you for that favor right now that favor upon his life right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, let's all stand to our feet and let's take this moment to, will you bring your gift to the, to the Lord as we worship? Come on. Take this offering, God.